Hi, welcome to the webinar. Uh, I'm Nick Donato, an industry specialist here at Navitar. Um, today we are going to be discussing something that is uh, really at a personal level a, a highly interesting topic. Uh, we're going to be talking about how private fund managers can find uh, what we're calling here their ESG mindset. Uh, now, what do I mean by that? Uh, well, what's happening at the moment in the industry is that more and more fund managers, including private equity and hedge fund managers, uh, are getting on board with responsible investment, but they're not always sure how to put those words into action. So I've recruited here some of the industry's top ESG specialists uh, to help us find out. Um, before, but first, before we get into that, let me get through some quick housekeeping. Uh, if you have any questions at any time during the presentation, by all means, send them our way. You can use that go to widget tool on your screen there to submit them. And what I've done is reserve some time at the end of our webinar here uh, for our speakers to field them. Uh, I will introduce you to them shortly. Um, secondly, because this always comes up, yes, a recording of the presentation will be sent to all of you. Uh, what we'll also do is include the slides. So look for that in your inboxes in the next few days to come. Uh, thirdly, uh, you may be wondering how Navitar fits into the picture. Uh, the simple answer is that we are a cloud provider for the private equity and alternative assets universe. What we do is provide fund managers a platform, uh, in fact we call it the industry's first connected growth platform because what it does is provide software that brings together a bunch of your workflows onto one system and that includes relationship management, fundraising, reporting, and, and managing your deal flow. Uh, in this context, we are, of course, talking about ESG. And what you'll hear is that responsible investment should be a part of your overall due diligence and investment process. Uh, Navitar is the system we hope you use to manage that process. Uh, we have built-in workflows that can be customized so that you can incorporate ESG action steps onto the system. Um, and it all sounds a little bit complicated, but it's, it's really simple, and, and trust me when I say that it frees up time and just makes you more efficient at your job. Uh, we have a customer success team who, unlike other cloud providers, are, are specialists in your fields. Um, also, allow me to thank Invest Europe for helping us put this webinar together. Uh, Invest Europe is the industry body formerly known as the EVCA, and how do I put this? Uh, if you don't know who Invest Europe is, you are not in the know when it comes to European private equity. Uh, but more importantly, they promote a lot of industry issues and they crunch a lot of data in a way that speaks to the private funds universe at large, uh, both in and out of Europe. Uh, and with ESG and the work that they're doing around that, uh, it's really a prime example of the type of impact that they're having. Um, now, before introducing our speakers, I want to set the stage here uh, because, as I said, ESG is now just this huge trend in our industry. And uh, truth be told, the trend hasn't really hit the mid-market in full force just yet. Um, I think that will happen eventually though uh, for a number of different reasons. Uh, so what I would do is recommend that managers get ahead of this curve if they want to separate themselves from the competition. Uh, because look here, uh, I want to put some hard numbers on what I'm talking about. Uh, Collar Capital, a secondaries investor, they what they did is they pulled a bunch of LPs and found that pretty much one in four are now willing to turn a fund manager down if they aren't green enough, let's call it. Um, and this is pretty surprising stuff. It used to be the case that LP in Europe, where this whole ESG trend really started, would turn down a manager for ESG reasons. Uh, clearly, that trend has spread across the globe. And now, even in North America, uh, about one in five LPs are willing to turn you away for not giving enough consideration to ESG. Um, and so get this, I did some digging and found that the last time that Collar even pulled LPs on ESG in one of its uh, uh, half annual barometers was two years ago. And in that survey, LPs named it as the least important skill a manager can have to drive returns, uh, which tells me that clearly investor sentiment on this issue has evolved. Uh, another thing, take a look at this. Uh, Managers are clearly responding to investor wants and demands. Uh, almost three out of four managers have now made a public commitment to ESG. In 2013, that figure was something like 57%. And at the same time, we have seen this marked uptick in the number of shops with responsible investment policies. Uh, this is up from 55% to 68%. And if they haven't done it already, it seems that virtually every manager has uh, or at least will shortly have a responsible investment policy. 
Uh, now, all of this that I'm, I'm speaking about comes with a bit of a caveat. Uh, these numbers come from a recent PWC survey, and I had a look at their sample size or, or, or the demographics of the sample, and it isn't wholly representative of the mid-market. Uh, because remember, when I said that, that the ESG trend has not taken hold at the top of the market in the same way as it has in the mid-market, where the resources and ability to hire specialists are more plentiful and easy to find. But the message here is that this trend will move down, and not just because investors demand it. The real upshot is that managers are beginning to appreciate that ESG is it's simply good business practice. Uh, look, if you're, if you're keeping your workers happy and you're cutting carbon emissions, you're not just putting a smile on investors' faces, you're, you're saving money and you're creating goodwill. Um, in fact, in that PwC survey, when asked what's driving responsible investment, nearly half, or, or 44% to be exact, of managers put risk management up as their top answer. Um, so here's the challenge. How do mid-market managers get ahead of this inevitable trend? Where do they start? And what does it mean to invest with an ESG mindset? Well, here's the good news. In November, on the back of all of these trends that I'm talking about here, Invest Europe published a ESG questionnaire that managers can use to assess ESG factors at the companies that they own or that they plan to invest in. And this DDQ is a great starting point, and it's a great framework for assessing how much ESG work a portfolio company may need. And where the best levers for ESG value creation are at that target portfolio company. Um, and also, because the DDQ isn't meant to be this exhaustive list of questions to answer every ESG question, uh, it also helps to identify the areas where you may need more of a technical assistance. And actually, speaking of technical assistance, that is a, a pretty good segue for me to introduce our speakers here. Uh, we not only wanted to, to uh, discuss the DDQ in more detail, uh, but we want to talk about these wider ESG trends as well. Um, all three speakers, in fact, were part of an Invest Europe committee that played a uh, really key part in developing that questionnaire. So they are some of the best minds on ESG in the, in the private equity sphere. Um, so leading to that, Blaze, can you please introduce yourself and then we will hear from James and Marta. Okay, hello. Um, Blaise Duo, i am uh, been working for PEI Partners, a French private equity fund for 15 years, uh, being part of the finance uh, team at the beginning of my career and then since uh, six years now, more focused on public affairs and ESG issues. I was uh, instrumental at my level to uh, launch a formal ESG strategy uh, back five years ago, which started for PI Partners as assigning the principles for responsible investment uh, costed by U um, uh, UN. Um, since then, I have deployed uh, efforts to raise awareness among my peers and I was appointed uh, two years ago uh, chair of uh, the ESG uh, Commission of our French uh, association, private equity association, I mean AFIC, and I've joined since then um, the, the equivalent at the level of Invest Europe, uh, a broader association. Prior to PAI Partners, I've started my career in uh, audit at the KPMG. Um, and um, uh, I'm uh, happy to take part to this uh, discussion and hope it will be uh, very helpful for those who attend it. Great. Thanks, thanks Blade. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's James Holly. Um, I'm head of responsible investment at KPMG, um, and that forms part of a broader sustainability practice. I've got um, well, 13 years or, or well, around 13 years experience now as a, an ESG practitioner, uh, predominantly supporting private equity clients integrate ESG into their investment processes. And I think, you know, we're certainly seeing much more appetite and interest around ESG um, from not only a due diligence perspective, but also helping uh, our clients identify and implement ESG strategies. Uh, for example, and I guess just picking up on one of Nick's points in the intro there, is that um, you know we are seeing real life cases where investors are refusing to invest in, in, in certain uh, GPs, private equity firms, 
um, based on the lack of ESG or robust ESG processes and systems that they have. Recently, uh, picked, uh, recently started working with one client that experienced that exact issue during their fundraising process where an LP refused to invest. So these issues are real um, and we're, we're here to hopefully help uh, raise that awareness for you and uh, yeah, look forward to being part of this, this webinar. I'll hand over to Marta now. Thank you, James. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Marta Jankovic. I am uh, working at APG Asset Management, which is an asset manager of Dutch pension plan assets. Uh, we're based in the Netherlands, uh, but we also have an office in New York and Hong Kong. And um, we currently manage uh, approximately 436 billion euros on behalf of uh, pensioners here in the Netherlands. So we're quite a large um, um, asset manager and we have had a responsible investment policy in place since 2007. Um, and uh, we have been uh, one of the pioneers in ESG integration, uh, both in uh, capital markets as well as in, in, in uh, alternatives. My role is to oversee the integration of ESG for our clients in alternative asset classes, which includes private equity. I have a legal background, used to be an in-house counsel, but then I saw the light um, and I moved away from uh, private practice um, and um, uh, my uh, uh, role as an in-house counsel into full ESG, um, which I think is um, a necessary thing for many of us to do if we want to really fully um, embrace this uh, emerging area that's now going mainstream. Um, I'm uh, chairing the current uh, Responsible Investment Roundtable, um, of which uh, both James and Blaze are members at Invest Europe, and I'm um, also a member of the board of Invest Europe. Uh, and I'm really, really keen uh, on making sure that the market understands what LPs need, and that um, uh, I'm really glad to hear um, that this is not just an area where LPs are driving and the GPs have to follow but that it's something that GPs are embracing as a good practice, as good risk management, as good value creation, and I look forward to um, the rest of this uh, webinar. Yeah, and I think that's one of the key points that we're going to hear today, Marta, that it's, it's not just about uh, satisfying LP wants, that this is, this is a way to create value and that this is a way to manage your risk. Um, so that being said, let's move on to the agenda. Uh, here we go. Here's the game plan, folks. Um, I'm going to ask James to provide a brief presentation on how you can use the DDQ in practice. Uh, the DDQ really is an intuitive document, uh, but it's valuable to hear from someone who played a hand in its creation on how it can be best used in the field. And in fact, seeing one of the audience questions already, who's asking where you can find this DDQ, um, I, I guess the easiest way would be you can go to Invest Europe's website. Uh, it can be found there. Uh, but also, um, every every attendee here will be emailed uh, in a day or two uh, that will include a link to both the recording of today's webinar as well as a link to that DDQ. Um, so uh, after that, uh, James's presentation, following that, we're going to build off of that by having a short panel discussion on the DDQ as well as these wider ESG trends um, because it's important to put this thing into perspective. So I'm going to rely on Blaze to provide the GP point of view. I want Marta to provide the LP point of view. Uh, James will be on hand to answer uh, technical questions. Um, and, and all this is to really find out how managers can find their ESG mindset. Uh, because that also means doing things like sharing your ESG work with investors. Or for instance, uh, including an ESG section into your quarterly report. So we'll hear about that. Um, so without further ado, James, please tell us more about this DDQ. Thanks, Nick. Um, if you wouldn't mind just uh, moving on to the next slide. Great, thank you. So I guess I just want to spend the next 10 minutes or so just to give a brief overview um, of the DDQ, um, how it came about, and um, just to give a bit of context around some of the, the questions um, that are included within it and, and how it might be used. Um, I guess, first of all, why, why did uh, Invest Europe uh, invest time and effort in, into producing, producing this useful document? And I think uh, a couple of really key reasons, one being, um, being the voice uh, certainly of the, the European, uh, or one of the voices of the European uh, private equity uh, industry and really being at the forefront of um, raising awareness around ESG, it was kind of seen as critical that 
uh, we wanted to continue to to push this agenda forward. And I think, uh, you know, off off that, the the other point to to raise is that I think, you know, ESG um, and and awareness has certainly um, I think increased over the last few years with various documents, reports um, that are out there in the public domain, majority of which touch on the sort of theory and the background to ESG. And I think Invest Europe were keen to try and move the agenda on a bit in terms of providing some guidance and tools to allow, you know, to allow private equity to actually start to properly integrate this. So that was really one of the key things. And I think that, you know, it's important to note that the 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 questionnaire is, is intended not to be a tick box exercise, but to be brought to life, to be used by the investment teams and the management teams of those companies that are required. And we'll touch upon that a bit in, in a few minutes. Um, I think just in terms of the process and to give a little bit of background, um, it was after um, a good few months back in 2016, um, a collaborative process that resulted in in the the final product and and it was a a number of uh, the LPs and the GPs that are part of Invest Europe that came together and worked together to share good practice and 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 the various tools um, and and checklists that they currently use to integrate ESG into their investment processes myself at KPMG um, as being part of the round table I coordinated the overall project to collate all of this information and uh, we set up a core working group that comprised um, a number of, of the members and I'll just quickly run through those just to give you a bit of background as to who those people um, and, and companies were. So um, in addition to ourselves there was Equistone Partners, APG, Triton, Spend uh, Capital, PAI, Advent, PGGM, EQT and Pantheon, so a, a real mix of both LPs and GPs. And um, as I say, the, the, those members shared a lot of uh, the existing kind of tools that they use in the investment process. So that gave us a really good platform to build out the, the questionnaire from that. Also using KPMG's experience in the uh, sort of the ESG transactional uh, environment, having you know, supported uh, many transactions, um, so we've brought our uh, methodologies and insights in, into the process as well, um, and as, as also building on existing tools in the market, such as the CDC ESG toolkit um, and others out there, just to make sure that the questions um, were aligned and similar, and, and building off what others had already published. So that just gives a bit of background into how it came together and I think the overall objective of having developed this questionnaire and, and what the, um, the group was hoping that it would achieve would be that it, it provides a practical tool for private equity investment teams to use during the due diligence process. For, the, for them to identify the key ESG risks and opportunities and for them to use it as part of any additional or existing ESG processes that they have on board. So it's very much a case of this is to be used alongside the existing processes that they use. And I think as, as Nick alluded to earlier, this is, is not a, an exhaustive list of questions but it's a a focused um, set of questions, um, you know, typical good practice type questions that we recommend are considered um, during uh, the due diligence process and also post deal when you're working with those companies um, to manage these types of issues and report on them. And I think that, that, that last bit is important as well. This isn't just about the due diligence process. It, the, the framework has been set up to enable post-transaction monitoring 
um, to, into, to help integrate those uh, issues, the ESG issues, into the, the ownership period and, and to be able to support the investment teams working with the management teams of the companies to identify the key issues, set KPIs and, and put together a reporting framework. In terms of uh, the, the structure of the document, and I don't know how many of you have actually seen it, but um, as Nick said, it is available on the Invest Europe's website, and hopefully you will all get a chance to look at it in due course. Um, mm. It sets out some generic questions at the beginning, just to give some background into the companies, the target, and, and their, their sort of processes and systems from a business perspective. And then it dives into ESG in the sort of broader sustainability governance uh, perspective, looking at questions around you know, roles and responsibilities within the company, what existing ESG framework and processes are in place, um, what training might be provided. Then it goes into the more specific questions um, which have been broken down into environmental, social and governance and within those the questions have been split into two parts and the first part of the ESG questions are, are what we and the members would typically see are some of the key core questions that uh, investors and the investment team should be thinking about during the, the initial due diligence process. Questions to enable them to get a sense of how mature the existing ESG uh, or sustainability framework governance systems are in like, those target companies, but then also providing some, some more detailed technical questions on the E, the S and the G that could have the potential to materially impact those businesses, whether they're a financial impact or a reputational impact. So again, those questions in part part one of, of, of the guide are very much focused on those you know, issues that could potentially have a, a material implication. The, the second part to the questionnaire lists out some more detailed questions, I think really aimed at once you've acquired those businesses, the deal teams and the management teams can use those questions to, to get a broader sense of, of what ESG issues there are in the business um, and, and also opportunities. Let's not forget there are opportunities from this agenda and we, it's not all about risk management, um, but very much to, to help, help those companies identify them and then put into place the KPIs and appropriate uh, mitigation measures and reporting frameworks as necessary. Nick, maybe if you just put to the next slide, I, I'll just start to give a bit of context around um, the actual questions and, 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 and the sections that, that I've just previously mentioned. From a uh, environmental perspective, I'm sure you're all familiar that environmental issues are, 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 are continue to be important, not only driven by sort of public public awareness, but primarily regulation. Um, carbon, as, as we all know, is, is, is rising up the agenda following uh, big public conferences like COP21. Um, the development of regional um, e, uh, sorry, uh, emission trading schemes, etc. So this, this all puts a focus on, on the need for compliance. And, and as a result, a number of the questions in the questionnaire are very much focused on assessing those technical environmental issues that could impact the um, financially impact or reputationally could impact the, the target and, and therefore questions that the deal team should be considering uh, during the due diligence process. Uh, Nick, if you just want to hit, hit the button just to bring up um, uh, the thank you. Um, so I guess there are some high profile cases um, globally and uh, you know some of these that are, are here on the screen just illustrate how these types of issues can be material. The US Clean Air Act um, uh, and the need to report on, on uh, 
carbon and greenhouse gas emissions um, has, has, has impacted some businesses and, and as you can see here Hyundai and uh, Kia were fined up to a hundred million dollars for under reporting so that just shows the type of issues and how they can materially impact businesses and again the questions as I mentioned are very much focused on um, drawing out those types of issues um, waste water effluent you see that in many businesses many manufacturing businesses food processing businesses um, and Nick if you just hit the next button that uh, there are financial implications associated with compliance against wastewater effluent for example here in the UK we're starting to see greater fines being handed out by the courts for environmental pollution and uh, last year Thames Water a utilities company was was fined up to a million pounds for a pollution incident so these are the types of issues that the questions look to help the deal teams identify and address in that due diligence process um, I mentioned earlier this isn't just about risk management um, it is also about looking at potential opportunities that the companies uh, may have whether they're already doing that or have the potential to improve potentially operational efficiency through energy reduction waste waste minimization more resource efficiency and we're still sound starting to see many more case studies coming out from companies where they're able to demonstrate the financial benefits of improving performance through the ESG agenda. Moving on to social, um, Nick if you could just hit the next slide please. So the, the questionnaire also sets out various questions to identify potential social issues. Now under social, obviously health and safety, which I'm, everybody is familiar with, is a, is a significant issue. So there are various questions that um, identify or help to identify how those companies are dealing with, with safety, what processes and systems they have in place. I think it's important to say that often social issues are somewhat or perceived that they aren't tangible. Um, but here there's some case studies you can see that you know failure to comply with the relevant safety regulations can have implications and financial implications and can impact reputation. Hugo Boss, clothing retailer here in the UK, was fined 1.2 million. Um, recently for failure to implement a robust health and safety management system throughout its stores. Unfortunately the uh, incident resulted in a fatality um, in, in one of its shops. So that just brings to life how serious and important these issues are and that they should be considered certainly in the due diligence process. Um, the questionnaire though does go beyond safety. I think it, it's fair to say that the the social aspect is ever increasing, the scope of issues is broadening, um, certainly around issues such as child labor and working conditions, and certainly those, those, those areas within the supply chain as well as companies. Um, supply base expands out into emerging markets and other areas. These types of issues are becoming more prevalent and, and, and and in need of identification and management. Uh, you may be familiar with the Rana Plaza incident in, in Bangladesh, uh, where many clothing companies were using a uh, supplier out there to manufacture their garments. And uh, unfortunately, because of uh, kind of various, um, I guess, quick measures to uh, erect the building and, and, and other short uh, shortfalls, in the construction and development of that site, it, it, it collapsed and um, had very fatal consequences. As a result, many of those companies that were involved in that have set up compensation schemes and 
I guess from a positive perspective, have um, put together very uh, or more robust codes of conduct in terms of working with their supply chain, etc. So again, these are the types of issues that should be considered as, as part of the social aspect of ESG when doing the due diligence. I think it's also fair to say that it does present opportunities as well and Nike, for example, working with its supply chain, being more transparent and disclosing information on that has reputational benefits and we're certainly seeing that across many other, many other companies. If we just move to the next slide and just to touch on governance, um, again, the, the questionnaire lists out various questions um, to help the investment team identify how essentially how well run the businesses are, how risks are managed, how they're integrated and controlled. And, and we're not just talking about ESG governance or sustainability governance, we're talking about corporate governance. Um, everything from how the board is, is structured, through to diversity on that board, remuneration, independence, etc. So the questions are geared to give the teams uh, an ability to assess how well run those companies are and, the, and whether there are any improvement opportunities to, um, to enhance the, the governance structures of those companies. Um, again, there are some case studies there where, you know, governance issues have caused financial and reputational uh, impacts to the business. Here in the UK, Talk Talk um, was recently fined £400,000 for a cyber security breach and we're hearing more and more stories around cyber security, anti-bribery, corruption, etc. So the questionnaires are geared to help address or certainly identify those types of issues and, and to provide the teams to, I guess, essentially develop improvement programs and to work with the management teams to, to uh, enhance the overall ESG standard of the business. If we just move to the last slide and to wrap up, I mean, I've already touched upon the fact that this questionnaire is or Invest Europe hopes the questionnaire isn't just used as a tick box exercise during the due diligence process, but is used post deal to help work with the companies, work with the management teams, develop appropriate ESG reporting frameworks, identifying the key material ESG issues, and putting in place relevant KPIs to enable them to monitor and improve performance in those areas. And I think one of the key things around ESG is the, the disclosure and reporting of, of what those companies are doing and, and how the investment teams that back those companies, how they're integrating uh, ESG into the process and into their businesses. And I think it's extremely important that those frameworks are put into place to enable greater disclosure and transparency and reporting to not only LPs, but to their employees, to the public and to broader stakeholders. I'll pause there for now and I think uh, happy to take questions, although I think Nick said that was best left till the end. So Nick, shall I hand back to you? Yes, thank you, James. Highly, highly informative. Um, in fact, a, a few questions are already starting to come in. I was going to save them from the end, but I see no reason why not to incorporate them into a few questions that I had for the panel. Let's make this live, let's make this interactive, and let's make it fun. So by all means, if, if there's any point that sparks some curiosity at your end, send your questions through that go-to widget tool. Uh, speaking of which, in that go-to widget tool, we have sent uh, all attendees a link to the ESG questionnaire. Uh, so just hit that little plus icon on the chat box and you should receive that link. Um, all right then, uh, this is, I think, a nice warm-up warm -up question to get the conversation going. Uh, we have someone asking about if the new U.S. political regime 
will have a negative impact on responsible investment trends. Or if I were to paraphrase that, may, may Trump dampen um, enthusiasm for responsible investment here in the U.S.? Who, who are you asking the question? Open floor. Whoever wants to take on the challenge of a, uh, a, a politically charged question, uh, okay. uh, hats off. <laughs> <laughs> from from, uh, from Paris' prospect, and, and you're probably uh, aware of the reputation of Donald Trump from Paris, uh, we are, however, convinced and we have had uh, received strong messages from the prominent corporates in the United States. Uh, regardless of uh, Mr. Trump's personal views, and, and w which comes actually to be changing over time, uh, we have a strong certitude, we have a strong confirmation that the, the, the most prominent corporate and, and, and biggest companies in the U.S. are fully in line uh, uh, with uh, conclusion of uh, COP21, for instance, and are fully aware of uh, the impact of ESG. So uh, as far as I am concerned, I'm totally confident in U.S. globally, I would say. Oh, I just yeah, want to add... And, and I think uh, this is a James Holly view rather than a, a KPMG one. I think, um, and as, as Blaze touched on, and, and we mentioned earlier, carbon is uh, and climate change is an extremely important um, topic. But I don't, you know, I, I think for me it also comes back to you know just simple risk management. And I think regardless of um, the, the regime and and uh, the, the systems that Trump will put in place, companies in the US, I'm assuming, will still have to comply with, with the relevant safety, environmental, broader social and governance, uh, regulatory framework that they have in place. So, you know, I think ESG is about investors being aware of those types of issues and ensuring that companies continue to comply with those, because as I was trying to allude to in my, my presentation, um, failure to comply even with the minimum standards, the regulatory regime can have financial um, reputational impact. So I, I can't imagine that companies will, will certainly stop complying. So um, for me, I don't think it will be um, a huge, huge impact. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I would agree with that. The, what's causing the trend of responsible investment um, in the U.S.? It's not been a political phenomenon. It, it has been a bottom-up approach of, of pensioners, of, of college endowments, who have been demanding this from their asset managers, and that has uh, trickled down to the fund managers themselves, who now appreciate the risk management that we've been talking about here. Um, another question, uh, Marta, I want to loop you in here. Uh, to what extent does ESG influence your fund commitment and investment decisions? I mentioned earlier that something uh, like one in four investors are now willing to reject a fund manager on ESG grounds, uh, but you are embedded in the LP community. What is, what is your sense of the trend? Um, well, before I jump to that um, answer, I'll just briefly address also what uh, the, the question about the change of um, administration in the U.S. and what the impact could be. I think, um, I mean, besides climate change, I think um, social issues are something that is really important. And I see that um, the, the, the social issues that arise from inequality, for example, are something that was also driving, uh, to some extent, the result of the elections. So um, I believe that focus on inequality, and that means focus on labor standards, and also things like the minimum wage or the living wage, if you like, are going to just grow in the future. Um, I would sort of tag on to what James said about minimum standards, uh, but don't just look at regulation and what um, you know the the environmental uh, um, framework is in terms of uh, what the regulator expects. But think beyond that. Think uh, uh, ahead of the curve because a reputational risk can come also from breaching something which is not written down in law and um, it can cost you a lot. It can cost you even if your business is only a B2B model 
uh, even when there is no consumer visible in the whole picture because um, it, um, it, it can impact on the um, actual, uh, if, you, if you're supplying uh, products or services to a, uh, a business that is facing customers, you might not be the, um, the partner that they would like to see. So, so think about all of those things. Think about the society as a whole, and I think um, that, that, that shouldn't really And then, Marta, your thoughts on what I mentioned earlier that something like one in four investors are now saying, I'm not signing with you if you're not, if you're not thinking hard enough about ESG. Uh, what's your perspective as someone who's embedded in the LP community? What's your sense of it? Oh, hello? Well, we may have lost Marta, but... Nonetheless, Blaze, I want to kick this over to you. Um, if you could put in your in your own words, what what's what's driving the force behind these ESG trends from the from the perspective of the GP of the fund manager? Um, di different causes. Uh, historically, I would say that given our business background, it was pure marketing uh, intention at the very beginning, and since we are progressing to those wide areas. Uh, we are uh, just touching uh, the, the spirit of, of, uh, of ESG and more and more encompassing the, the uh, a more uh, consistency approach, uh, a more reputational approach rather than pure, uh, pure marketing and business approach. Um, so uh, I would say first it was a catch-up uh, under the gentle pressure of our prominent LPs. Uh, the most important LPs in the world water community uh, are for sure uh, the, the, the biggest pension funds uh, who have uh, experienced uh, in the last 10 years actually a rising awareness about reputation risk uh, because in turn they also um, try and, 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 and gain additional pensioners and in order to do so they have to address the most uh, uh, the most critical issues and questions among which we have ESG. Uh, so starting from this uh, uh, reputation view, uh, it expanded all over the community uh, and accordingly the GPs. Uh, having said that, as far as France is concerned and probably other countries, uh, you are probably aware that we have uh, in France a specific reputation probably due to the fact that um, in a in our public opinion, uh, people are uh, prone to be quite uh, uh, challenging when it comes to uh, describing our industry uh, for a valid reason and, and possibly due to the lack of communication we experienced in the past. So it is for us a, a, a huge opportunity to try and better understand our main stakeholders in France since actually when it's come to making transactions and investment, the company we are investing him, uh, we are investing into, are, are supposed to uh, create value uh, that will be shared among uh, uh, not only the management uh, teams, but also more and more importantly, uh, uh, the employees who are uh, part of, of, of the deal uh, in in uh, a, a number of uh, transactions and, and more and more, um, and those uh, future. Uh, uh, rich employees will become uh, pensioners that will in turn a few years later invest into pension funds and so on and so on. So we are part of a huge uh, uh, economic wheel, if I may use that word, and um, the consequence of that is that we have to have to fully consistent uh, in the way we act when it's come to making transactions or uh, manage portfolio companies and the way we interact uh, with all uh, our surrounding stakeholders, not only the employees in the portfolio companies, but also the media, uh, the political leaders, and, and, and uh, of course our investors. Yeah, and I, I don't think that even a, a Trump administration would stop a trend like that. And uh, James, I want to I want to loop you into here. When you were creating this DDQ, and, and I suppose this is an open question to all, uh, was there any envisionment of how fund managers are going to to relay this information and this ESG work to their investors? Is it conceptualized that they will have an ESG section on their quarterly report? Is it something that they would report into the LPAC? Or are you just relying on fund managers to take a suit, suit what's best for them approach? 
I, I, I'll just answer this, I guess, from um, what, what I've seen um, working with various private equity clients. Um, and, and I don't think there's necessarily a, a standard uh, one way to, to do this and to report. I think it, it's important that private equity uh, investors consider the needs of their, their companies consider the needs of the, their LPs, their key, L, key LPs, and, and then divide and develop um, a reporting structure that, that appeases all of those, if you like. So, um, you know, it, it does feel like quarterly reporting, certainly with some of the clients I work with, is, is, um, is becoming sort of good practice um, and, and, and annual Kind of investor investor relation uh, conferences or AGM type uh, scenarios is, is where it's reported. But I think it is important to stress that uh, the structure should be set up um, and uh, in, and to consider you know the company's needs because it can be a burden on very, some of the smaller companies that don't have the time and resources. Um, to 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 invest in in putting robust systems in place, so it needs to be a careful balance. Can I add uh, to if that, I um, if if I, if I may, um, that um, what we are seeing and what is actually happening is that um, LPs are asking for reporting in a more systematic way. So, uh, for example, APG asset management, if we're committing to a GP, um, we have a mandatory requirement that we would like to have annual reporting, ESG reporting in place. And we have developed a template that we use for that purpose that our GPs would receive and we would then include it also in the side letter. So this is something that uh, I think is very serious for managers to uh, be prepared for and we want portfolio by portfolio company reporting. So that means if you're using a due diligence questionnaire like the one we've got here and you're monitoring companies and you're able to extract a couple of KPIs, um, that is really um, essentially uh, the very good start. So um, I'd say um, reporting is, is really moving into the, into the center, uh, left, right and center for LPs that are keen on uh, demonstrating to our own clients and beneficiaries that um, ESG is being done properly during the life of the fund. Marta, that, that, that's highly interesting because uh, something that we heard earlier from James was that uh, the S and the G of ESG are, are not as tangible as the E, that it, it's difficult to quantify. We could have a portfolio company say we've cut carbon emissions by 25% this quarter, which is great. But how do you measure something like if the workers are happy or if the corporate governance stance are in place? So when you created this reporting template, how did you tackle those challenges? Um, as far as we are concerned uh, at PEI, uh, I'm not fully in agreement with your views. I think we can measure things. Uh, we, it's just a matter of balance between what we measure and often consider as weak signals and uh, an overall assessment based on th those weak signals, which is something else, which is more qualitative and, 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 and probably more the spirit of the questionnaire which we are talking about here. But still, uh, in the social area, for sure, and as far as we are concerned as GP when it's come to investing into companies, uh, there are at least two in social indicators which are on the first, uh, on one hand, uh, available, which has been available for a long time now, and, but uh, which are under the sc scrutiny of any reporting teams, is uh, work, work accidents on one hand, and absenteeism on, on the other hand. So those two indicators are quite uh, interesting in order to assess uh, the level of uh, many issues in companies uh, from motivation, uh, disorganization, management issues, and so on. So as, far, as soon as we got uh, uh, indication in, in, uh, in those signals, it is the starting point when we will have to dig into uh, further in order to, to, to understand uh, what's going on.
I think I had some connectivity issues here. Um, my apologies. Um, and um, maybe I'll tag on to what Blaise just said in that I think social issues are extremely important to investors. We deploy our capital because we want to demonstrate social responsibility. And that is, uh, environment is one part of that. But social and governance issues are just as important. And whether or not you have quantitative information is not so crucial. It's crucial to show that something is being done. And that can be also done in a narrative form. So it doesn't have to be uh, how many, um, you know, how many lost time injuries, how, much, how many people you, you, you uh, let go or, or hired. That's all important. But human rights, sometimes you just can't translate into numbers. And you're not supposed to. And that, that doesn't mean that they're not important. Nope, we, we may have lost Marta again, but, but up. Oh. Yeah, sorry, just, just to add to that, and I think, you know, as we mentioned earlier, the questionnaire uh, won't necessarily tackle um, all, all of the, the potential risks and issues, and, and, and as I said, needs to be used um, in line with or, or in parallel with other existing tools um, that are available. And I think certainly, you know, there are even sort of basic employee type surveys that company uses to gauge how, how motivated um, the, the workforce are, 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 are excellent and simple and practical ways of, of doing that. Um, even safety culture there are now tools available that allow you to assess the culture, the safety culture, how well safety is embedded into the organization through you know various various tools. So there are some some really useful and, and, and practical um, uh, you know solutions out there as well. And then a, a few more questions I want to get to get through. I know we're bumping up close to the end of our time, but Something that I, I hear a lot of managers uh, talk a great ESG game, and they may look at the DDQ, they may incorporate some of the elements into their investment policy, um, which is which is great. But then on the other side of the negotiating table are the LPs, and some of them have told me that they're uh, they're not always sure how they separate the GPs that that talk the ESG talk and, and those that actually walk the walk. Um, so does, does anyone have any uh, best practices here for? really determining uh, who, who's taking this, this ESG mindset that we're calling it seriously. Maybe as an LP um, I will take this and um, just to say that we have an ESG assessment tool that we've developed in-house which is really looking under the carpet of the GP's ESG integration. So if, we, if you have APG as your um, LP doing diligence you will get um, to answer uh, a, a lot of DDQ questions but, um, but these questions will be evaluated and also we have face-to-face -face meetings with the GP and um, I think it's pretty hard to hide something from an LP who has a lot of experience with this type of diligence. Um, so I think to, to those GPs that think you can just copy-paste, uh, my message would be don't do it um, because um, it will look really bad um, and I've had some... Uh, Oh, we we may have lost Marta again, um, but I want to get through one last question. And 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 Blaze, maybe this is best directed yeah. towards you. Is that for me? I wonder. Uh, we have this ESG DDQ, and we and we have new tools to assess ESG factors at target portfolio companies. Is there is there any type of expectation of what a fund manager must do after ESG concerns are identified? So you see that the problem exists, and you may have seen that problem by using the DDQ. Are there action steps that are expected? Is it, 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 does it fall on you? Is there a fiduciary duty to, to respond to them? Yeah, actually, it is. Uh, it is quite connected with the the, the previous question, and 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 actually, uh, I will start by going back to the question and then uh, answer your your last question. Um, as far as you the talk to talk or walk the walk uh, are concerned. Uh, and as far as we are investing into uh, limited companies, as the LPs in, are investing into uh, GPs. We are uh, uh, obsessed, if I may use that word, by the consistency between words and acts. I mean, for us, it is as important to talk uh, and to act. Um, 
it is important that in our world, uh, our portfolio companies uh, cast promises and have uh, and have strong commitments first, because it first it is an indication of the quality of the governance that we have in place. The fact that we have at the top management in those companies people who are aware of the global uh, concerns, the global major questions uh, in society, and you cannot escape those questions. So uh, we expect strong stance from the management of those portfolio companies, and so accordingly we expect them to talk, but then we expect them to, to walk, and we expect them to be consistent with the promise and to uh, re uh, to to uh, to execute uh, what they're committed to do. And as far as the second question is concerned, of course, uh, should people uh, should the, the people involved face a tricky situation that they, they just cannot hide it, they have to address it because. Um, uh, and it's not obvious in certain portfolio companies, and it was not obvious at uh, GPs like us at the very beginning, because we had to move from a, uh, an, an historic stand which was more um, confidentiality driven, in a sense, uh, let's, uh, let's pretend that we ignore it and it will be okay. You cannot have that stand any longer, uh, unless being uh, challenged and, and, and or accused of negligence. So you are obliged to acknowledge the issue and to go and to deal with it. I think that's right, and it's going to be felt more and more in the mid-market um, in the time to come, as, as mentioned at the start of the webinar. Um, well, I think we've gotten through all of our questions, or most of them. Um, if we were not able to get to one of your questions, uh, please reach out to me. I'm happy to put you in touch with any of our three speakers. Um, I want to thank them for joining us today, and I also want to thank Invest Europe for partnering with us on this webinar. I uh, also mentioned thank at the you. start is that a recording of today's broadcast uh, including the slides, will be emailed to you in the coming days. Um, and if you'd like to learn more about Navitar Private Equity and how we can help you manage the investment process, uh, including creating some workflows for ESG management, uh, please do not hesitate to reach out. Uh, you can see my contact details there on that last slide. Uh, so on behalf of Navitar uh, and Mother Earth, I'm Nick Donato, and enjoy the rest of your day.